Chavarim and welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry with myself, Leah. And it is so good to be back with you today for another teaching. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be learning something together as well as being challenged and inspired through the Word of Yahweh, which is so important because we need to be studying the Word of Yahweh. And also, I almost feel many, many times that the most beautiful lessons we can learn and the truths that we can glean from are found in the lives of the people of the Bible. And we just need those lives to come alive, come alive for us. And sometimes some people like Joanna, the disciple who we're going to be talking about today, they are only mentioned in maybe a few verses or maybe even once or twice in one or two verses, just like Joanna was. So today is going to be exciting as we get into her life and as we are inspired to discover that there was actually a female disciple named Joanna. And yes, she was a disciple. So before we get into this teaching today, let us just close our eyes and pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy. Father, we pray a blessing over this time that we are together, Father, that you would just help us be enlightened by your spirit, help us be inspired by your truth and your word, because it is so inspiring. And Father, may we just learn and glean, may we be encouraged and challenged and changed. May we have questions answered today, Father. May people who come to listen, you know, Father, may they have their their questions just answered may they be challenged to do more to give more to grow more father and may they be inspired by the life of joanna who is now one of those great cloud of witnesses cheering us on every single day so father we just thank you so much for this may we learn exactly what you want us to learn today and we thank you we commit this to you yeshua for you are our awesome elohim and our beloved messiah and savior we say thank you yeshua in your mighty mighty name amen So like I said, Joanna, the disciple, who is she? What was she about? What was she doing? And what can we learn from her life? So let's get straight into it. Luke 8, 1 to 3 says the following. Now, this is one of the only places in the entire Gospels where we hear about Joanna. And so it's so important that we just take note of what she's actually doing and what it actually says. And we can break it up from there. So it says that after this, Yeshua traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Now, This is so, so incredibly important. We have, you know, I know that we hear a lot about Mary called, you know, Miriam of Magdala. And I did a teaching on her and you can find that on our channel because, you know, she appears in almost all of the Gospels. I think, in fact, all of them, she is there, very alive, very present. And so we know quite a lot about her, but we don't know much about Joanna and even Susanna. So Luke takes us here into the inner circle of Yeshua's world. He takes us through the throngs of the crowd into the quiet places where Yeshua really sat alone with those who were closest to him. And those who were closest to him were also his female followers. Because here Luke says that the twelve were with him. The 12 apostles as we know them, but then also some of the women who were with him. So here we have his very close, closest followers, his female followers, his disciples, they are all together. And you know what? These followers, these female followers, they provided for his needs, Yeshua's needs, and also for the 12 that were with him. They provided, they gave of what they had. They traveled with him and they were just so intricately part of his ministry and part of his miracles. They bore witness to that. And they must have borne witness to a great many things that Yeshua did. Not only the things that he that he did as in the miracles, but also bore witness to the way Yeshua lived. The way Yeshua was, his personality, his life, how he taught, what he taught, they saw it and they lived it. And here in chapter 8 of Luke's gospel, he names these women and he actually draws our attention to three specific 
woman because he does say that there were many more. There were many others, but he draws attention to three specific women. That Miriam of Magdala, who I mentioned, Joanna, wife of Chusa, and then also Susanna. And these three are mentioned specifically as they were more than likely the three female leaders within the inner circle. And that would be much like John and James and Peter were. Because though Yeshua had 12 disciples, remember 12 apostles that were there, he really spent time with the three Peter, John, and James, where he's innermost circle. And that's very likely how it was with these three women. They were the three leaders of the women that were following Yeshua. And so Joanna's name actually means Yahweh has been gracious. In Hebrew, it would be Yohanna, which is very much like John. And obviously in Hebrew, John is Yohanan. And so hers is the same. It's the same root. It's the same word. And it means Yahweh has been gracious. And truly her life, her experiences and her examples reveal the truth of this very statement. So who was Joanna and what was she doing? Now, Joanna provided like Luke tells us that Joanna provided for Yeshua out of her own possessions and out of her own property. And the Greek word that is used here is hyperx, oh, hyperx, I don't know, maybe that's how you say it. <laughs> or maybe you speak Greek and you're like, Aaliyah, that is not how you say it. Well, it is that word. And it's not only found here, it's used in Acts 2, 45. When new believers sell their possessions and property and they give it to anyone that is in need. How beautiful is that? That's the example that was said. And Luke emphasizes the giving of these women. And he shows just how much value Yeshua had for women, which is so, so, so important. You know, in fact, Yeshua included women in every aspect of his ministry. And they became co-laborers with him. And the same example is set among the Apostle Paul's ministry. If you go and look at his letters, you go and look at the life that he lived Paul had co-laborers, Phoebe, Junia, Priscilla. They are all there. There are so many of them that are mentioned as co-laborers. And, and a co-laborer is someone that works in spreading the gospel and preaching the kingdom in the exact same way, in that equal sphere, and that equal space as someone else does. And so that was what Yeshua did. And Joanna is introduced to us as a woman who had probably been cured of a disease or life-threatening illness. And after receiving this beautiful touch of love and mercy from Yeshua she becomes his follower not only does she follow him she is mentioned among his inner circle which distinguishes her really from the great multitude who was following Yeshua and remember they were following Yeshua only for what they could get for the food that they could get and we read about that in Mark 4 and in opposition and in very stark contrast Joanna she doesn't want from Yeshua instead she gives from her own resources to provide for the ministry of the man that she recognized not only as her rabbi but also as her messiah it wasn't about what she could get from him she wasn't following him like the great multitude had she was all about yeshua you've touched my life you've saved me you've healed me what can i do and give to you as a love offering from my life and that really distinguished her from so many other people who would just following him for what they could get and like I said she became a co-laborer and she was a wealthy woman she was married to and and how do I know that let's just pause it how do I know that because it says that she was providing for Yeshua out of her own resources so she was married to a man who was a very high powered official in the household of Herod Antipas and also that placed Joanna in a very very unique situation it meant that she risked her life to follow Yeshua, which I'll touch on. Because Luke tells us that her husband was Chusa, the steward of Herod's estate. And this position placed Joanna in a position where she would have witnessed the inner conversations of the nobility. She is standing at a higher level of society. You know, they are among royalty. And she's providing for Yeshua out of her own substance. That's what the original word is, substance. So she has her own goods. She has her own wealth. It's not connected to her husband. She's giving out of what she has. Maybe she inherited money. Maybe her family died. You know, maybe her, her father left things to her because the Torah dictated that that's how it could be. And so Joanna has things that she's just yielding to the work of the Messiah. 
when she would have also attended royal gatherings. And you know what? In all probability, she was the one who told Luke about John the Baptist's beheading, which took place at a party banquet for guests, for guests that Herod had invited, for people that were serving him, and for him himself. Herod was sitting there, you know, among his guests, just having this rambunctious party that was just going. And Joanna would have been there because her husband, Husa, would have been there. And there's this inside information about Herod that comes comes through in Luke's gospel and a number of times in Luke's gospel Herod's name is mentioned but only once are Yeshua's words about Herod documented only once and those words are actually found in Luke chapter 13 which is a part of Yeshua's ministry that is so undocumented by others it's so special because it's just this inner inner workings and dealings that Yeshua is doing here. And it's part of his ministry that other gospels don't talk about. And Joanna knew Herod personally and her position of standing in society and with her husband as well would have offered her this really, really unique opportunity to access behind the scene realities, not only of what's going on with John the Baptist's heading or with Yeshua talking about Herod, which she would have paid attention to, but also of Yeshua's trial. Because Yeshua was tried before Herod, before Pilate, and Husa, her husband, must have been around at that time. So she would have gained that access and entrance to the behind the scenes reality. And imagine one of Yeshua's most devout followers, Joanna, at the very center of the noble courts, a woman of wealth and a woman of prestige herself, who was a witness to the intrigues of the day. It's very much probability of how it happened. And you know what? She was placing everything she knew at risk by following Yeshua. And this speaks to our lives so deeply. Who was Herod? Now, this is not Herod the Great. This is Herod Antipater or Antipas, as he was nicknamed. And he features very prominently in many of the stories of the Gospels. His father was Herod the Great. And Herod the Great bequeathed sections of Judea to his sons. And the area of the Galilee and Perea was given to Antipater. That area there was given to here, Herod Antipater. And this area... Antipater would govern for over 40 years. Now he had this desire, he wished to be accepted, he wished to be loved and celebrated by the people and he sought to follow in his father's footsteps because Herod the Great had been a master builder and so Antipater he wanted to be exactly the same and his most spectacular offering was the capital city of Tiberias which is situated close to a natural hot spring and it boasted this very large palace that he had that was built high up above the Sea of Galilee and as the governor of the Galilee you know Herod was placed in a situation where he soon had a problem and the problem that he had was John the baptizer who was baptizing people in the Galilee area and now Herod we know as the Bible tells us specifically in John 14 5 that Herod had actually divorced his first wife Phasaelus and had married his half-brother Philip's wife which was condemned it was this dramatic reality that he entered into and in a dramatic fashion which attracted the condemnation warning from John you know Herod Antipater was placed in a very very hard situation because John the Baptist condemned what he did and warned him as well and we know the story because eventually Herod he he beheaded John he beheaded him after Herodias's daughter his new wife her daughter Salome danced before the guests entertained them all and there there was this whole intrigue that happened and John, he got beheaded for warning and condemning about what was happening with his brother Philip's wife. So, you know, Antipater was really in this situation where he was governing Galilee and he wanted to be loved. He wanted to be known. And here he was, he had married a woman that he claimed to love, and yet it was against the Torah, it was against what was happening. And more than likely, Joanna was present at this event of John the Baptist beheading, because her husband, Husa, was obviously Herod's household steward. So he was there as well. Imagine him standing next to Herod's, you know, big throne that they sat on in those days because he was the overseer. He had to be there if orders went out or things were happening. So it's very likely that Joanna was there. And many scholars suggest that she was actually the source of this information for Luke as he penned his gospel letter. And Luke later writes and tells us that Yeshua 
was first sent to Pilate for questioning, but then Pilate hears that Herod is in Jerusalem for the Passover celebration, and he sends Yeshua over to Herod. Now, Pilate is wanting at this stage, later on in the gospel, round about Luke chapter 23, you know, Pilate is wanting to wash his hands completely over the allegations brought against Yeshua because he sees what's going on and he knows Yeshua is not guilty of any crime. But you know what? He doesn't want to do this out in public because he doesn't want to lose that face. So at the same time, he then sends Yeshua over to Herod because he hears that Herod Antipater is now in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. This is a great opportunity. But by wanting to wash his hands of the allegations brought against Yeshua, you know, this relationship between Herod and Pilate is not so very, very good. And Luke 23, 12 tells us this, that Pilate and Herod didn't have a good relationship. Why didn't they have a good relationship? Well, that's very, very interesting because, you know, Herod was a very irrational, paranoid man. And he was his father's least favorite choice to ever inherit anything in Israel. He was not chosen as heir. And so as such, Herod Antipater, he tried to maintain a lot of power and control over everything that belonged to him. And unfortunately for him, both John the Baptist and Yeshua the Messiah were known as Galileans. And so Herod was faced with so-called troublemakers in his midst. And so what actually happened was Pilate sent Yeshua over to Herod. And through doing that, he recognized the governance and the authority of Herod as being the governor of the Galilee area. And Herod's half-brother had actually ruled over Jerusalem, but was found to be not a good ruler and so he was replaced by Pilate and this matter made Herod very very uneasy because you know what this was how it was over this area it was you know Roman rulership was what was happening at that time and so Herod became very very uneasy because if his half-brother could just as easily be replaced by Pilate who had Roman authority who was liked by the emperor and was put in authority there in Jerusalem well then Herod thought to himself any minute someone could come and take my place so there was a very very uneasy relationship that existed but by Pilate recognizing Herod's authority in the Galilee area we are told in the Gospels tell us that Yeshua's death and his trial actually unified the two and the two became friends Pilate and Herod became friends over the death and the trial of Yeshua it's a very sad reality but it happened because it was all about maintaining power and maintaining control and so we also told that Herod desired to meet Yeshua and was initially quite excited when Pilate sent Yeshua back over to him because we are told that Herod wanted to see Yeshua perform a miracle or a sign of power and so he was really really excited but Yeshua refused to perform any miracle and Herod actually had him beaten and sent back to Pilate so you know what with Joanna's close relationship to Herod through her husband's position as Herod's steward and her devout faithfulness to Yeshua it was a threat in every single way remember Herod desired to keep his position of power and men like Yeshua were a threat to the tension that always resided beneath the surface of Jewish leadership in Roman Judea because it was part of the Roman Empire and everything was always in a tense state. There was always a knife point edge that was happening and Yeshua's followers were also a threat. Yet this reality, if we look at Joanna's life, this reality never ever deterred Joanna from following Yeshua, never. Instead, her presence made for a testimony and it made for an eyewitness account of the happenings in the court of Herod. And she displayed courage and she displayed conviction by choosing to follow a man that was considered a threat to every single ruler at that time. Yeshua boldly declared himself the Messiah. He boldly declared himself the son of the living God, one who has a kingdom and will come and establish his authority upon the earth. And his disciples, you know, they were following him. He had thousands of followers. Yeshua had thousands of followers and he was considered a threat. And that is why he wasn't only considered a threat to the rulership, he was considered a threat to the priests, he was considered a threat to everybody, and so were his followers. And so this is where Joanna was really standing. She's connected, it 
to Herod through her husband's position. She's in a very unique position, but also in a very fragile position. And yet it never deters her from following Yeshua. She's given out of her substance. She's always there. And she never, ever deserted him. Not once, not ever, not on the morning of his trial, the day of his crucifixion, and even at his resurrection. Because Luke 24, 1 to 10 says the following, and it's beautiful and it's telling. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the woman took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Messiah. They did not find the body of their master and King Yeshua. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like light stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered these words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others who were with them told this to the disciples, but they to the apostles. But they did not believe the woman, because their words seemed to them like nonsense." That's sad. Their words seem to them like nonsense. And you know what? The Gospels tell us of this dedication. This is dedication. This is absolute dedication. And it's the devotion of these female disciples of Yeshua that is really stretching forth to us. Because they're present at the crucifixion. They do not leave Yeshua's side at all. They are there. And after resting on the Sabbath day according to the Torah commandment, they prepare spices to anoint Yeshua's body and then they go down to the tomb where Yeshua was laid. And interestingly enough, the Gospels accounts, you know, they mention actually many different women at the tomb. They mention these different women. So when you look at the different gospel accounts, you will see one mentions this and one mentions that. But it's a Luke, however, who very, very specifically mentions Joanna. He is the only one that mentions Joanna in this place at the resurrection and she was present for the majority of Yeshua's ministry she was there at his crucifixion and she was a witness to the resurrection and think about what is happening here these words that are spoken by the two angels gleaming like light reveal the depth of the relationship that Yeshua shared with these women not only was this resurrection promise and the telling of things to come spoken to the 12 apostles as we are often taught but these things Yeshua's resurrection right spoken from his mouth when they were still in the Galilee he spoke these things to these women who were with him because the angels say remember what he told you and they heard it from Yeshua and then they received the angels words with belief because the angels said to them remember what Yeshua said to you when you were in the Galilee and then they were suddenly filled with joy they were suddenly filled with excitement and they did not find it hard to believe that Yeshua had actually resurrected as the depth of their faith was so strong that they actually believed that the impossible could become possible wow I feel like crying when I think about this reality when I say those words to you because it challenges me to think to myself that you know when Yeshua tells me something will I remember it and believe that the impossible can become possible this is resurrection from the dead this is someone that they saw crucified their Messiah that they saw put on that stake crucified and just enduring the most awful horrible death and then going to the tomb not finding him there and believing that he would raise again that he wasn't there because he was resurrected it says that they they didn't find that impossible and yet when they report the sequence of events to the apostles it says they go to the 11 they tell them what's happening they say we saw these angels And these angels told us that Yeshua is resurrected. He's among the living. And these men, they they just are, they're thinking, these women have lost it. They are talking absolute nonsense. And that's a sad reality. But you know what? These men are struggling with doubt and unbelief. 
And, and there's this beautiful thing that Luke does throughout his gospel that he writes. Throughout his gospel, Luke plays opposites alongside one another. And here he contrasts these women and their belief with the men who followed Yeshua. He places them alongside each other and he says, look at these female followers of Messiah Yeshua. Look at their faith. Look at how they believe that the impossible can become possible. And look at how these guys are just battling with doubt. And they don't believe these women because they themselves needed a mind change. They themselves needed a heart change as to how Yeshua saw women and how Yeshua included women in all of his ministry. Stark contrasts are presented to us and they leave us just yearning for us just to know more about these women whose names and examples would have really been lost if it was not for Luke. If Luke had not decided to record what they were doing, well, we wouldn't have even known about them and people would have debated their entire lives as to there were no female followers of Messiah Yeshua. Well, there were and we are thankful for Luke's gospel because Luke's gospel reads like this very intimate biography and it details the life of the man named Yeshua, the man called Messiah. And Luke was very, very well positioned to document the life of Yeshua. He was educated. Luke was educated. He was trained as a physician. And you'll notice that Luke's gospel account plays very, very close attention to diseases and to sicknesses. He was very keenly inquisitive to share his findings on the Messiah. And Luke makes his address and attention very, very clear from the onset. He clearly states that his intention with his writings, and he, he actually says that he's addressing this to a man named Theophilus. And he says this in Luke chapter 1, right at the beginning. He says that I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. And I too have decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things which you have been taught. And that was what he wanted to do. That was what he wanted to set out. He wanted to investigate it. And you know what? A good investigator, you know, like a investigative reporter or an investigative journalist today will go through eyewitness accounts. Go right to the source, the people that were there, the people that witnessed things. And that's what Luke did. You know, he wrote to prove, you know, he has this intention. He wrote to prove after careful investigation that Yeshua was indeed the ideal man, a man who was perfectly capable of being the Messiah of mankind. Luke's gospel is also the only book in the scriptures that contain a sequel, a continuation, and that book is called the Acts of the Apostles. And the four Gospels, they speak in very, very different tones. And its writers include different characters and different stories. But Luke has a beautiful way of including women, not only in the Gospel of Luke, but also in the book of Acts. And he shows their prominence in the life and the ministry of Yeshua. And later, in the work of the very first congregations. So from the very, very beginning and the introduction of his gospel, we are reading of women's experiences. Think about it. And we're also reading about their strength and their connection to the Messiah. A large number of women's stories occur in the gospel of Luke that do not occur elsewhere. One of these stories is the story of Elizabeth and her barren womb. And Luke details the righteousness of Elizabeth right at the beginning in Luke 1 and her husband Zachariah and he shares with the readers all the details about John the Baptist, all the details of his birth and what happens and the promises around him. Luke also goes on to share about the highly favored virgin named Miriam who Yahweh chose as the mother of the Messiah Yeshua. And Miriam's relationship with God is wonderfully shared through an intimate song that sings praises to her Elohim. It's only, only shared in the Gospel of Luke. There's details, intimate details of Miriam's experience with the angel Gabriel, her surrender to Yahweh's will, along with the bond that she shared between her and her aged pregnant cousin named Elizabeth, who this is deeply recounted here in the Gospel of Luke. These narratives are not found in any other Gospel. And so many scholars believe that one of Luke's eyewitnesses that he went to to investigate all about Messiah was Miriam herself because her words they just shine through so brightly at the beginning of Luke's gospel her heart is shared and her connection with Yeshua is shared it's expressed right from the beginning of the gospel of Luke and throughout the first very few chapters the reader is told over and over again we read it continually that Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart 
That's what Luke 2 says in verse 19 and 51. And who else would have known this? Who else would have known this besides Miriam herself? Besides her? I mean, she's saying she treasured up all these things in her heart. That's like you and I. We have a secret. We keep it to ourselves. No one else will know that information besides us. And so who better? Miriam herself, the mother of Messiah Yeshua, being the eyewitness. Luke goes and he wants to meet her because he wants to know exactly everything about Messiah Yeshua. Imagine that. This is a reality. This is not just thinking, hey, it could have been or it might have been. This is a reality. I believe it is a reality. And so as we read the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, we can actually hear Miriam's voice. Because, you know, I've been a journalist for 12 years. And when I interview people, I interview them and I ask them questions. And they speak words to me, which I document. And obviously, I create a story. From In an interview, you're, you're protecting people's words. And so, although I'm the writer, they really are the tellers. Their words really, really come through. And so, even though Luke is writing, it's Miriam's experience that is coming through to us. It is her words that are floating off the page and impacting us. Her words, female words that we are hearing. We also read about the widow of Nain, the bent over woman in chapter 14 of Luke. We also read about the prophetess Anna that's not mentioned anywhere else. And the unnamed woman who broke the alabaster jar with Messiah Yeshua. All of these are included in the Gospel of Luke and they're not included elsewhere. And as I said to you, Miriam of Magdala, well, she appears in many, many different places within, within the Gospel stories. But however, Joanna, she only appears once, actually twice, but only here in Luke's account, in Luke 8 and Luke 24, where he's talking about this. She becomes, I truly believe, an eyewitness because he goes through great pains to mention her. And he mentions her position as a follower of Messiah Yeshua, as a very credible witness to his inner ministry and inner teachings. And he also says, Luke says, that she was providing for him out of her very own substance. Who else would know that besides the woman herself? Adrian Hastings is a scholar and a teacher of the scriptures. And I wanted to include the following that he wrote about Joanna. And he said, a less renowned but not less valuable source for St. Luke was, I feel, Joanna the wife of Chusa, a certain eyewitness of the gospel events. Why did Luke bother to mention her? Her name was ignored in the earlier gospels. And Luke's apparent anxiety to name her, in his would be well explained if she was one of the sources of his information. This, which has often been suggested before, is far from an airy hypothesis, for Joanna was certainly in a position to provide much of that special information which Luke did actually come to possess from some unnamed source. I completely agree with Adrian Hastings to say that Joanna was a source for Luke's gospel and not only then is she someone we read about just here or there she also becomes someone whose words shine through we may not be able to hear her voice so specifically if we kind of scratching around and look for it but we can know that much of her information that she handed over and gave to Luke that she told him be it about Herod, be it about Yeshua's trial, be it about John the Baptist beheading, be it about the, the way she followed him or what she did or how she was connected to him or the other woman that followed. Those are all her words and they really, really, really do speak to us and come through for us here. You know what? I truly believe that there are no chances and there are no accidents in the stories of our lives. Joanna was healed and she became a devout follower. And her unique position and devotion enabled her to be an eyewitness to the events of her day. Her words and her experiences all shine through and her life enables us to know just how included women were in the ministry of Yeshua and just how powerfully he uplifted women and showed the world how women were to be included, how they were to be called, anointed and chosen for every single special work of the kingdom. You know, Joanna, her life and the life of the woman she knew as friends and fellow sisters in the faith, this speaks to us so that they can tell us that we can give up everything. It's possible. We can give up everything to follow the Messiah and be included among his very faithful remnant 
to this very, very day, the remnant that he is calling to today in our generation, right here, right now, their lives, they really speak to us to count the cost, to give it all. And they, they really give us a glimpse into the fact that many, many women followed Yeshua. They were close disciples and they were really, really became taught ones of the God man named Yeshua. They gave everything. They counted the cost. And many of them, well, we will never really know their names or even their stories. And some of them could have such deep stories that would really probably startle and astound us. We don't know those stories, but we do know the stories about Joanna. We do know that she was definitely there. She was in the position you know, to provide for Yeshua out of her substance. She was also in the position as a high woman of noble standing to be a credible eyewitness to the things that Messiah Yeshua did and to provide that information to Luke as he did his careful investigations into the life of Messiah Yeshua. So I really pray today that Joanna's life is speaking to you and that it will continue to speak to you and that you will find yourself in the story of that Messiah Yeshua is writing right now, that your life will become one of counting the cost, giving it all. And you know what? Living to know that your Messiah is alive and that he's doing amazing things in your life and that he will continue. Just give it all every single day, every single moment to him. And he, he will use you. He will use your life. You know what? To touch hundreds and thousands. Right now, 2,000 years later, we are sitting talking about Joanna I bet she didn't even think that we would know who she was, but we do. We do today. We know who she was, and she's impacting us still today by the sacrifices that she made that, that we only read about in one or two verses in our Bible. But imagine how deep and profound and how much more depth and grace and giving her story actually holds if we could just know the full story. But today, let us just glean from what we do know. And thank you, Yeshua, for these examples from the woman that followed him. So let's just end up in prayer. Father, we just, we really are so grateful, Father, for your word. We're really so grateful to know your truth and, and to have your word that really speaks to us. We are grateful for the women that have gone before us, Father. Throughout all the hundreds and hundreds of years that have gone before us, we are so grateful for them. Father, we are grateful for the ones that we know and the ones that we don't know. The ones that are named and the ones that will always be unnamed. We are grateful. May we take our place among them, Father, as people who are living on fire right now to change the world today, Father. May we take our place eventually among them as the great cloud of witnesses that cheer on the next generation. Father, I'm so grateful that we can know about Joanna and thank you for the example that Luke left for us to emulate, Father, to show that we can give it all without worrying about what we can risk or lose or, or what the cost may be. Father, it's not about that. Give us the strength and the courage and the grace and the conviction, Father, to live a life that is full Father, just to give it all to you because you deserve it. Yeshua, bless the special person that is listening to this teaching today. Bless them as they as they hear my voice, Father. May they feel a touch from your spirit. May they be blessed in every single part of their heart, their soul, their bodies, and their spirit today. Nourished to know that you love them, you care for them, you've called them, you've chosen them. And may we be Joannas in this generation. Yeshua, we pray this in your mighty and most powerful name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me. And it's been so great to be with you here today to be talking about Joanna's story. The notes will be up on our website, treasuredinheritanceministry.com. You can go in and get them. And as always, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you will find all these wonderful teachings that we've already done and that we will do in the future but don't forget that if you want notifications when new teachings come out on youtube or you want you know that exclusive little preview of what we're going to be up to on our youtube channel you have to click on the bell and you have to follow that there because that is important because then you can be part of that community where you can find out the preview of the new teachings that we all have coming out but if you don't want to click on the bell, you can just click on subscribe and you will still receive the notifications. We love sharing this truth with you. We love sowing these seeds and we pray that they are truly, truly blessing you. Until next time, shalom, shalom and see you then.